The giant King Bran the Blessed looks out from his home in Wales and sees the Irish fleet sailing across the sea. With them, they bring a proposal of marriage to Bronn's sister, Bronwyn, that will unite the two kingdoms. Bronn sees this will be good and agrees to allow his sister to marry the Irish king. A great feast is laid on and celebrations begin, but Afnissian, half-brother to the ancient and mystical children of Lear, as well as half-brother to Bronn and Bronwyn, is upset that no one asked for his permission for the union too. In revenge, he mutilates all the Irish horses and angers the Irish. They demand war or compensation, and King Bran, desiring the union of the kingdoms, offers a magical cauldron capable of bringing warriors back from the dead in recompense. The Irish king accepts the cauldron and marries Bronwyn. After the ceremony, they sail back to Ireland to rule together. There, Bronwyn gives birth to a son, Gwern, and the next few years seem to go well. But the Irish are swift to anger and slow to forgive. They start to speak out against Bronwyn on account of their horses and accuse their king of not being man enough to stand up and seek vengeance. The abuse builds until Bronwyn is all but deposed as queen and sent to work in the kitchens where she is beaten and abused every day. She spends what little time she has to herself training a starling as her only companion, and one day she sets it free and sends it to her brother Bran with a message begging for help. Enraged at what has become of his sister, King Bran musters his army and sets sail across the Irish Sea to rescue her and punish the Irish. No boat can hold Bran, but he needs none. When the Irish look out from their shores, they see a sea that looks like a living forest of ship masts, so great is the Welsh army afloat. But at the forest's head, marching along across the sea floor, head in the open air, is the giant Bronn, with a fearsome look on his face. The Irish are frightened and panicked. They attempt to bar the Welsh army's passage by cutting down a bridge over the river Shannon, denying access that would take the force inland. But King Bronn bridges the gap across the river with his own arms, allowing his people to advance. At this, the Irish lose heart and seek parley. They promise Bronn they will make amends by offering to seat Bronwyn's son Gwern on the Irish throne instead. Unsatisfied, Bronn rejects the offer at first, until the Irish also promise to build Bronn a house befitting his great stature in which to live. Fearing bloodshed, the rescued Bronwyn begs Bran to accept the offer, and at last he does. But the Irish are treacherous. They build the house for Bran, and tell him they will hang one hundred sacks of flour inside for he and his men to use. Except that inside each sack is an Irish warrior waiting to drop onto the unsuspecting Welsh as they celebrate their easy victory and newly built house, and kill them. However, once more, Ephnissian intervenes. Suspecting deceit, he enters the house, finds each warrior, and crushes their skull as they wait. The feast begins in earnest shortly after, and Gordon celebrates his new role and the new relatives he has met from Wales. Except, Gorn forgets to greet Ephnissian specifically, and once again feeling snubbed, Ephnissian grabs Gorn and throws him into the fire. As the boy burns alive, Bronwyn tries to enter the fire herself to save him, but Bronn prevents her, knowing she will die as well. A fight breaks out among the Welsh until the Irish, seeing an opportunity, join in. The Welsh, united against the Irish, look to have things all their own way until the Irish bring out the gift Bronn gave them so long ago, the cauldron. They begin putting their dead soldiers into it and drawing them out alive again. Finally, Ephnissian realizes how much trouble he has caused his kinsmen with his hot temper. Playing dead among the fallen Irish, he allows them to pick him up and toss him into the cauldron, which he then sacrifices himself to destroy from the inside. The Welsh manage to win, but at the cost of the life of King Bronn, whose final instructions are to cut off his head and bury it in London, where he can watch and protect England. They do this, 
and bury him at the White Hill of London, facing France. And on that hill, the Tower of London is eventually built over the top of Bronze Head. Which is one reason why ravens are always kept in the tower. Both to ward off invasion and in honor of Bran, whose name means raven. This is GM Word of the Week, and I'm Fiddleback. Ravens, the bird, are part of the family Corvidae, and by and large there is no real difference between a raven and a crow. Ravens just happen to be a bit larger most of the time, though this is certainly not a universal rule. Either way, the most interesting fact anyone can tell you about them is that they are really smart birds. Just, like, so smart. Really, really smart. Very smart indeed. But what does that mean? What does it mean to be a smart animal? It's a funny question. The problem is the standard against which we compare them. Which is, of course, us. People. Human beings. See, evidence to the contrary, we're happy to put ourselves at the top of the intelligence charts and ask all the other animals on the planet to maybe get with it and shape up. When you're as smart as us, we say, then you can have a biscuit. But it might be that our standard is a bit off. It might be that animal intelligence should be measured differently for each type of animal. After all, we're not very good at burying nuts in the forest in the summer and then finding them again in the winter without having to write things down. But squirrels manage it well enough that they survive from year to year quite well. So who's smarter then? The squirrel, obviously. Look at his little cheeks. So, when we talk about smart animals, we have to be careful to compare them on their own terms. Squirrels might be good at finding hidden nuts, but they score really poorly at driving from L.A. to Reno in a Cadillac. You have to be really careful about comparing oranges to oranges and not to, say, thermonuclear weapons. With that said, when it comes to birds, the corvid family of birds is right near the top of bird intelligence. And of course, even this has a caveat. Not all members of the family exhibit the same level of intelligence in all the same areas. In essence, we found a new set of comparison oranges. The corvid family is made up of a number of different birds, including crows, ravens, rooks, jackdaws, jays, magpies, and nutcrackers. And while the family as a whole is pretty smart, some members tend to underperform. Just like Uncle Al at the family reunion. You're related, but you might wish you weren't. Within the Corvidae family, the real superstars of the group are the European magpies and the rooks and crows. The others are clever, sure, but magpies and crows really get all the attention. The reason the magpies get the nod is twofold. For one, their brains are, relative to their body size, nearly as big as that of chimps, orangutans, and humans. Right? That's a fact, isn't it? Well, no, not really. It's a specific region of the bird's brain that makes all the difference. The nidopallium. The nidopallium is a region of the bird brain responsible for executive functions and is roughly the same as the prefrontal cortex in mammals. Executive functions are, in a very basic way, the set of mental processes and cognitive abilities that allow goal-directed behavior. These include memory and reasoning, and mean that a creature with high executive functions is better at organizing tasks, remembering details, and solving problems, among other things. For a bird, the bigger the nidopallium in relation to body size, the better it is at directing its own behavior to meet its needs. This is where magpies win in the corvid family. The second reason magpies do so well in the bird intelligence race is because of the mirror test. The mirror test works like this. Take an animal and put it to sleep. While it's asleep, apply a sticker or a daub of pink to its forehead, just like your college roomies used to do to you with a sharpie after those drunken parties. Except without the vulgarity. When the animal wakes up, it finds itself in front of a mirror, which is a very rude thing to have happen upon waking up for anyone, let alone an animal with a mark on its head. Now normally, an animal can't see its own forehead, so it has no idea what it should look like. If, in front of the mirror, the animal reaches up to its own forehead to investigate the mark instead of reaching out to the mirror, this is taken as a sign that the animal recognizes itself as an individual. 
it has a sense of self. Testing has shown that great apes and humans, as well as dolphins, orcas, a single Asiatic elephant, and a little fish known as the cleaner wrasse, are the only animals to have successfully passed this test, and Eurasian magpies, making it one of only a handful of animals other than ourselves to know itself, and therefore one of the smartest birds on the planet. Except, except maybe that isn't entirely true. Remember that one of the chief problems with identifying intelligence in other animals is the standard by which we compare them. The argument can be very persuasively made that more animals than we think can recognize themselves and other members of their species as individuals. They just aren't very good at doing it in mirrors. The most obvious examples of this are the use of song and scent. Birds and mammals can clearly distinguish between individuals based on either of those factors. Dogs, for instance, seem to recognize individuals by urine markers deposited about various trees and posts. Under testing, some dogs showed the ability to distinguish not only other dogs by scent, but themselves as well when changes are made to their urine deposits. This makes sense when you consider that the hierarchy of dog senses is smell, then hearing, then sight. For a dog, seeing something takes back seat to two other senses, and therefore something in a mirror which possesses no scent and makes no noise of its own might not be real enough to bother with. The dog's sense of self comes from other stimuli, and so it may go with other animals. Still, even though the mirror test is fraught with these and other concerns, some animals pass it and others do not. Whether this makes one smarter than another is up for debate, but the magpie is one of a very few number of animals that has passed this sort of test. So when it comes specifically to recognizing itself in a mirror, the magpie does pretty well, the best among the corvids. But remember, they were not alone for showing a bit of brain that humans respect. The rooks and ravens were up there as well, for something else entirely, tool use. Now, undoubtedly, you know all about tool use. We hope so, otherwise we aren't quite sure how you're even listening to us right now. Maybe you had a friend play us for you. We don't know. But hey, cool friend. Anyway, tool use is one of the things that differentiates us humans from other animals. And for a long, long time, we thought we were the only creatures on Earth that could make and use tools. We were, we thought, entirely unique on the planet for that reason alone, if nothing else. Then some people started paying better attention to the world around them and found that other animals did it too. Sure, none of them had a Mark V shopsmith in the garage, but they were doing the best they could with what they had. Thanks to the work of people like Jane Goodall, it soon became clear that many primates were tool users. Chimps would use broad leaves like umbrellas to keep the rain off, for instance. Elephants were pretty handy too. They used leaf-covered branches to keep flies at bay and to plug up self-dug watering holes to prevent evaporation. Even dolphins were getting in on the tool-using act with sponges held to protect their noses, which are properly called their beaks, while foraging for food in the sand of the ocean floor. So by the time rooks and crows came along with their stick-using behavior, tool use among the animals was kind of old hat. It wasn't quite so special anymore. In fact, it turns out that lots of animals use lots of different tools to do lots of different things. Even among birds, crows weren't all that unique, and rooks hadn't even been observed to use tools outside of captivity. What gives? Why were they so special? Well, what gives is the sheer variety of tools rooks and crows are capable of using, and the way they are prepared to modify them for use. See, it's one thing to pick up a stick and jam it into a hole after some termites, but it is entirely another thing to pick up a stick and then modify it to work better before jamming it into that hole. Which is just one of the things they can do, trimming sticks to size and even shaping them to fit the circumstances. Among the many capabilities of the tool using corvids in addition to stick wrangling is the crosswalk technique used by American crows. The crow will find a particularly fine nut it would like to eat, but that it can't get into due to the hard shell. Instead of struggling with it, they simply go to the nearest crosswalk, drop the nut onto it, and wait. Eventually, a car will run the nut over, and the crow gets a meal. Note that they aren't just blindly dropping the nuts onto a hard surface to crack them, they are deliberately using crosswalks because not only do cars pass through there, they also have to stop from time to time to obey the traffic laws. 
which gives the crow a chance to collect up their winnings. Even more interesting is the ability of rooks to solve puzzles in the laboratory in order to get to food. Some even seem to understand the properties of water, making use of displacement to raise a floating food to a level at which they can access it. Best of all, perhaps, is a rudimentary understanding of gravity that allowed some rooks to understand that larger and heavier objects would roll down a ramp faster, giving them quicker access to the food hidden at the bottom. Ravens and crows seem to have one other important sign of intelligence, though. The ability to read and understand human intention. Barbara Klukas of Humboldt State University and her colleagues were able to demonstrate that urban crows were able to distinguish between humans who were merely strolling by and those who were focused on the crows. They took off much sooner when approached by people focused on them than they did when approached by casual passers-by. Crows seem to know when to stick around and when to get out of dodge. They've learned that people looking at them were much more likely to attempt something potentially dangerous than those who weren't. John Marsloff, a co-researcher on the same paper from the University of Washington, ran a slightly different experiment. In his experiment, two groups of fellow researchers were given two different sets of masks to wear. They then went to the local park. One group of researchers was asked to trap crows, and the other group would just walk by them. Having done that, Marsliff and his colleagues waited five years before performing the second half of the experiment. When they returned to the park, again with their masks on, they discovered that not only did the original birds remember which masks were trappers and which weren't, they had also taught their young to recognize which was which and react accordingly. The birds reacted to the trapper masks by mobbing the individuals and shrieking at them. And it's hard to argue that a bird capable not only of recognizing individual humans, but also of passing that information on, isn't pretty smart after all. Which is probably one of the reasons ravens and other corvids feature so prominently in the folklore and mythology of so many different groups throughout history and throughout the world. Take, for example, the nursery rhyme, One for Sorrow. It's a children's rhyme that involves counting magpies and explains how they might be able to predict or even influence the future. Often considered birds of ill omen, it was important to know what they presaged. The rhyme goes something like this, though other versions do exist. One for sorrow, two for joy, three for a girl, four for a boy. Five for silver, six for gold, seven for a secret never to be told. And it was important to properly address a magpie, too. If you encountered just one magpie, it was imperative, for instance, to invite another along as quickly as possible to forestall ill fortune. On the other hand, it was also said that the magpie rhyme was more about predicting the future happiness of a soon-to-be-married couple, and the number seen on the happy occasion of a wedding was indicative of the couple's fortune. In North America, the rhyme centers around crows instead, since magpies are much more rare there. And now you know where the 90s band Counting Crows got their name. Still, North American crows were responsible for more than a band name for a lot longer than just the 90s. Many Native American tribes, particularly along the northwest coast, have some form of lore involving the crow or the raven. And usually, raven is cast as a trickster. A trickster is pretty much as it sounds, a character in a story who is intelligent, knows a bunch of secrets, and uses that to play tricks on the other characters or defy the usual rules and conventional behavior. Tricksters are cunning and delight in breaking with locally accepted customs. They're often thieves and show little respect for authority, and by the time they've done their work, there's no way to go back to what was once normal. Which is just as well, because without the archetypal trickster, we'd be in a much sorrier state. Why, we might barely even exist at all. One of the stories told about Raven among the various tribes of the Northwest goes roughly as follows. There was once a big, powerful, rich chief who was so big and powerful and rich that he was able to capture the sun and the moon and hang them up in his house. This, of course, made everything outside the house dark, and the people could not hunt or fish. If they went out to look for firewood, they had to crawl around on their hands and knees, hoping to bump into something that might be wood. They'd have to bite what they found to make sure it was wood and not something else. Raven heard about the trouble the people were having because of the great chief, 
and went to his house to get the sun and moon back. There, Raven met the chief's daughter, but when Raven asked the chief for the sun and the moon back, the chief refused. So Raven came up with a clever plan to get them back. Raven watched the great chief's house. Every morning, the chief's daughter would come out of the house and go down to a small stream to collect water. After she collected the water, she would take out a drinking cup and have some fresh stream water for herself. Then she would return with a full pail of water to the house. Raven saw this happen three days in a row, and on the fourth day, when the chief's daughter came down to the stream, he turned himself into a tiny fingerling fish and jumped into the water. The chief's daughter filled the bucket with water from the stream, and as usual, she stopped to dip her drinking cup into the stream. Raven, disguised as the tiny fish, swam into it, and the chief's daughter drank him up without noticing him. Once inside the daughter, Raven turned into a baby, making the chief's daughter pregnant. A short time later, she gave birth to a baby boy that grew very quickly because it was really Raven. Soon he was a young boy, and the great chief was very fond of his new, fast-growing grandson, who was really Raven. The great chief loved him so much that he would do anything for him to keep him happy. One day, Raven the boy began crying and crying and crying as if he wanted something. The chief asked his grandson what he wanted, what would make him happy. And the boy, who was really Raven, pointed to the sun and the moon hanging from the ceiling. The chief wanted his grandson to be happy, so he let the boy play with the sun and the moon. He even let the boy who was Raven take them outside to play with. For a while, Raven the boy played with him, but then, when the chief was inside, he threw the sun and the moon high into the air. When the great chief came out to see what had happened, Raven turned back into himself and flew away. Since then, there has always been light. All of which means you should pay careful attention to tricksters, which we will for the rest of the month. Welcome to 2021 and thanks for listening to the show. We get off to a bit of a rocky start to the year, but seem to have caught up now and are dutifully looking ahead to see what the rest of the year brings. As a listener, new or old, who likes what you have heard, we cordially invite you to support the show on Patreon, along with many of your fellow listeners. Head over to gmwordoftheweek.com and find the yellow banner at the top of the page. Give it a click and you'll be taken to our support page where you can find the Patreon button. Your support helps keep the show ad-free, which everyone seems to like. This episode was researched, written, and produced by Brian Casey. Music was provided by Blue Dot Sessions. Where there are wars, there will be crows, the carrion fanciers. And ravens, too, the warbirds, the eyeball gourmands. <laughs>